Um, thanks for the introduction there. And yeah, prior to joining uh, Scottish Drugs Forum, I was uh, my background's in mental health nursing, and I was working for NHS Borders Addiction Service team manager at the time there, but also the local take home naloxone coordinator. So although I'll be given a, a national perspective of what's going on in Scotland, I'll also be drawn on some of that local experience, uh, particularly uh, when we look at some of the, the challenges that we might be facing uh, nationally. So, um, title self-explanatory there, so why was there a need for a national naloxone programme in Scotland? Um, what's the situation with drug-related deaths? Um, <coughs> how did we go about achieving our national programme and what, how does it take shape at the moment? And also, what's next for the programme and um, what are the developments going to be? So, it would be wrong of me to stand here and say that we have the most fantastic programme ever. Uh, the reality is that the people who were involved well before me in the programme have laid the foundations, if you like, for it to be a fantastic programme. And um, at the moment, we have a great programme, um, but we need to let it reach its full potential. Um, and there's always room for improvement. If you've stopped looking for improvements, then you're in the wrong job. Um, I'll also say that I'm really trying my hardest to do my poshest accent ever, <laughs> given that subtitles wasn't really an option. So I do apologise if I fall back into it halfway through. So I'll try my best. <coughs> OK, so then just having a look at what the situation is in Scotland, um, this is the kind of picture that we have at the moment. So a population of about 5.2 million people. Um, we have 14 health boards and 13 of the health boards are involved in the national programme. One of the smaller health boards, NHS Western Isles, uh, is not. So 30 alcohol and drug partnerships, 29 of them who are involved. Uh, it's all 16 prisons in Scotland are signed up to supplying people with naloxone when they're liberated. We have around about 60,000 people um, with problematic drug use, and um, around half of those are known to services. And we have approximately up to 25,000 people receiving methadone. And that's a figure there to bear in mind when I start talking about the numbers of supplies in Aloxone in the, a while. <clears throat> okay, so this is the situation with our drug deaths. Um, we've had this increase in trend in drug-related deaths for several years now. In um, 2011, we had our highest ever number of uh, recorded deaths, 584 people losing their lives that year. Um, and last year, only a reduction by three deaths. Um, so we now have an average of 554 people die needlessly every year. This is wholly unacceptable, um, particularly you know, when we're looking at staff being in contact with most of the people who end up um, losing their life. So we, um, every August we have our drug-related death figures published, and that gives us the numbers of people who died, the drugs that were in their systems, the areas in which they lived. And around about six months later, we have our drug-related deaths database report, which gives us the more individual circumstances surrounding the people who died, and these are the, the common factors that we find. So people are more likely to die in their own or a friend's home. Um, they're more likely to have had a recent non-fatal overdose. Um, there's also been several hours between the actual overdose and the death. Other drugs have been present around 90% of the time, and of course the main drugs that we find in Scotland in people's bodies when they die, heroin, alcohol, methadone, and benzodiazepines, and diazepam being the, the main uh, benzo. Um, it's also the older, more experienced injecting drug user uh, who dies. And when we're talking about older drug users, we're talking about people aged 35 plus, which is by no matter of means old. Um, but often is the case when people have had a 15 to 20 year history um, of uh, polydrug use, that accumulative effect and the a huge range of comorbidities that people are often faced with, particularly in relation to their physical health, is definitely a, a factor that puts them more at risk. Persons more likely have had a recent abstinence or a reduction in their use, so they've maybe been in prison, or they've had a detox, or the purity's changed in their heroin or what they've been using. Um, something's happened to change their tolerance. Um, people are less likely to be in treatment when they die. Um, this is a, one of the particular issues that always uh, is raised um, in a training session when I'm delivering it, and mainly delivering training sessions to uh, nurses in particular who are working directly with people who use drugs. And unfortunately, still remains the case that we still have um, a fair amount of people practicing who have this kind of punitive practice. Um, in, you know, that kind of stuff, there's a time and a place for that to be challenged. 
In my personal opinion, that is at any given opportunity. Um, and, you know, this whole thing about putting uh, restrictions on people, you miss some appointments, you're discharged, you're using on top of your uh, prescription or you're discharged, it's crazy practice and it's putting people at increased risk of death. So. Yeah, don't expect to come on my training and not be challenged about that sort of stuff. Um, and the other important point is um, that witnesses are generally present when people die. Um, so not necessarily always uh, other drug users, although the majority of the time it is, but sometimes family members. Um, but the, the fact that the witnesses are present is a perfect opportunity for intervention. And it's not always the case that you know people don't want to help. People generally don't want their peers to die. Um, but it's um, often the case that, you know, either not recognising that it's an overdose in the first place or just not knowing how to intervene can be a barrier, but also other barriers to um, getting professional uh, medical assistance, I suppose, as well. Um, so in light of these um, different reasons, uh, the fact that two of the main drugs that are present in people's bodies when they die are opiates and that there are witnesses present uh, allows a perfect opportunity for take-home naloxone to be introduced. Okay, so uh, this does not give um, credit really to the huge amount of work that went on behind the scenes about what was um, uh, going on to get us our national programme, but I've not got time to get into the nitty gritty of all the detail. Uh, back in 2005, there was a national drug-related death uh, conference held by Scottish Drugs Forum and by the Scottish Government, uh, which highlighted the need for take-home naloxone. Around about that same time, there was um, an amendment to the Medicines Act, which meant that naloxone could now be administered um, by anyone for the purpose of saving a life. So anyone can administer anyone's naloxone to anyone, legally, perfectly legally, for the purpose of saving a life. Uh, again in 2005, uh, there was a, a trip to Chicago, to uh, the Chicago Recovery Alliance. Um, unfortunately, that was uh, before my time. Um, however, there were members of SDF who went. It was a multi-agency fact-finding trip, um, and a lot of the good work that was being done in Chicago was um, brought back to Scotland for learning, and that led to a couple of pilots in Scotland. So Glasgow and Lanarkshire had their uh, take-home notes on pilots 2006-07, and then Inverness in 2009. Um, and then finally, 2010, um, Fergus Ewing, who was the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs at the time, uh, launched the National Naloxone Programme, which had cross-party su support and was fully funded by the Scottish Government. And Scottish Drugs Forum were commissioned uh, by the Scottish Government to be the kind of main coordination for the programme and to deliver the training and other resources. So, um, if anybody's not familiar with our patient group direction, basically a written set of instructions that allows uh, nurses and pharmacists to make um, supplies of prescription-only medicines to people for unplanned care. So this is what um, naloxone's being supplied on the whole with across Scotland. Um, the two kind of um, main areas where supplies are available are nurses who are working in community addiction teams, um, harm reduction teams, Scottish Prison Service, the nurses there. Some voluntary sector uh, organisations will have nurses working within them and they also um, can supply naloxone there. Um, and pharmacists working in needle and syringe programmes and some community pharmacists as well. Uh, the reason that there's not a huge amount of pharmacy supply across Scotland is because of course there's an additional fee attached to pharmacists, ma pharmacists making supplies of naloxone. So on the whole it's mainly nurses who are making supplies. Um, and then services across Scotland are also being supplied with naloxone. Um, so uh, we had to have Lord Advocate guidelines to allow that because it's a prescription only medicine. We needed something to cover us to be allowed to supply services. So you'll find that hostels, homeless services, the likes, uh, are, have a, a service supply in case somebody overdoses on their premises. There's also workers in outreach <coughs> services carrying naloxone as well. Um, and the criteria for getting a supply of naloxone is um, history of opiate use, current opiate use, and that includes opiate replacement therapy, um, being over age 16, and uh, going through the relevant training. <coughs> okay, this is the uh, product that we were using. So, um, strength naloxone hydrochloride a milligram in a mil, and it's a two mil pre-filled syringe. Uh, so five doses in there. Um, it has two 23 gauge inch and a quarter muscle needles in the pack uh, with this lure lock fitting now. Um, uh, there was a flow chart and a patient information leaflet in the box and this can uh, tamper evident tape uh, around the side of the box as well. 
Um, this was basically the hospital pack, but was amended for community use. So a third party assembler would have to put in the needles, um, physically draw on the uh, markings on the syringe barrel to make it clearer, um, and then seal it with this tape, and that was it fit for community use. Uh, now, of course, we have the new licensed community product, which we're moving to a uh, brand name being Prinoxide, so the, the pack will be a lot, uh, a lot better. Okay, um, the way that we monitor our programme, every time somebody does a supply of naloxone, um, that information is put onto a spreadsheet um, with no identifiables to the person other than their postcode, or the first three bits of their postcode. Um, and that's sent to Information Services Division who collate all the information on uh, how many supplies are going out there, what areas are they being supplied from, was it a first supply or was it a repeat supply? If it was a repeat supply, what was the reason for that? Was it because they were... Um, the kit was lost, was it because it was used or some other reason? So these are the numbers that we have so far. So brilliant start, uh, almost 6,000 kits supplied in the community uh, at the last monitoring report. The report's published at the end of July every year. Um, around 1,500 supplies from prisons, fair to say that the prisons are needing to up their game a bit. Um, and 365 repeat supplies due to a uh, use of naloxone, a successful use of naloxone to reverse somebody's overdose. So that's fantastic. And they're the only ones that we know about. I'm sure there'll be uh, many more. Um, so areas have been set. Um, Scottish Government has set this uh, recommendation or target to local uh, alcohol and drug partnerships that they should be reaching around 15% of people in their areas with problematic drug use. Now, what I would say to that is, uh, that's an abysmal low figure. Um, to be honest, if it had been up to me, <laughs> it had been way higher than that. But we needed to set a target that was going to be achievable for areas. Some areas were at the point where they were exceeding that. Some areas were way off the mark. Um, so it needed to be achievable. What I'm always telling areas is, uh, well, don't get too comfortable, because that's going to increase year on year. Um, so don't just get to 15% and think, oh, yes, we've done it. Um, keep going with that, because that target will be increasing every year. Okay, this is just to give you a bit of an idea of where I'm coming from as a, a nurse. Um, obviously, when uh, I put this together, I didn't realise the screen was going to be so enormous. <laughs> um, but uh, there you go. Um, so, um, so I was um, tasked with being the local lead for naloxone in NHS borders, and you know I thought this was an absolutely fantastic intervention that we, as a treatment service, could introduce to our clients. Um, so people using our service um, immediately started to be supplied with naloxone, following us uh, having the training. Uh, myself and a few dedicated uh, uh, nurses really keen to get it rolled out uh, so anyone that we saw and because i was the manager at the time i was able to make it the priority in the service you know anybody that you see who has a history of opiate use or who's on opiate replacement therapy get them a supply and a lot so now if not why not um so i'm um, personally from my experience if i was uh, had a, a clinic and i was seeing people and i'd be like oh, have you got any mates in the waiting area bring them bring them in and anybody else that could um we could come into contact where we were making supplies to them. Um, they did not have to see us as a treatment service um, in order to get a supply in naloxone. Um, so, yeah, we made it the norm. Anybody attended the service got naloxone. Um, by the time the first year's monitoring figures came out, I had um, flown the coop and I was away to SDF. Um, but um, the report was published and the borders were the highest performing area in Scotland, so we're absolutely delighted. It was a fantastic achievement for the, the few nurses that had worked really hard uh, to implement it. Uh, however, it was fair to say that not everybody shared our enthusiasm about it. Uh, and this is what we got. I know there's a lot of text here, but um, one of the local politicians um, decided it was an absolute disaster that we were... Um, supplying so many people with these kits and we really need to, to have a rethink about this and this drug's going to encourage heroin users to test their limits and then all this kind of carry on. So uh, luckily we had um, some supportive comments in place of that as well but I suppose that's just to highlight you know that it wasn't all easy easy sailing and I was delighted to see that this year when the report was published there was none of that and there was no negative press that I was aware of um, in fact some of the press that, that came ac across with this year's monitoring report was well why is this area not doing as well as that area and so that was quite refreshing to see um, right it took me ages to decide what to call this section 
Um, some of the things I wanted to call it were just entirely inappropriate, especially now when I see the size of the screen to have written up there. Um, but um, challenges I settled with, I'm still not entirely happy with, and you might see why. Um, but really what I'm talking about here is um, some of the... Um, some of the reasons that will be uh, described to you about why people are not making naloxone so normalised. I mean, I naively, when I came from the service I was working in, thought this was happening everywhere across Scotland, that you know nurses were just really taking this on board and uh, firing it out left and right and centre. Um, Taking you back to the figures that I mentioned in the first slide when we were talking about almost 25,000 people um, receiving methadone, well, we should have around 25,000 naloxone supplies out there. It should go hand in hand. Um, I know that these are the folks who are less likely to die. Um, however, it's about coverage and it's about increasing the supplies of naloxone out to the people we have already contact with um, so that naloxone is more likely to be present at the scene of an overdose. So I've picked out a few uh, of the kind of issues. Um, so one of the ones that um, comes up quite frequently is, well, we don't have time to deliver this training. Well, it takes 10 minutes. Um, you can do a brief intervention with somebody um, in 10 minutes to equip them with the skills necessary to uh, save someone's life. So um, when I hear people saying, I don't have time, I think, well, where are your priorities placed? Because surely that's the first thing that you want to do with a person when you first meet them. I mean, what better way to set off your relationship with somebody when the first time that you see them, rather than filling in 20 bits of paper, what's that person going to get from that? But if you're able to spend five, ten minutes with them talking about naloxone, supplying them with it there and then, what a powerful way to start off your relationship with that person by, t by showing them <coughs> that you care about whether they live or die. Um, so my answer to that is, well, make time. Um, this is probably one of my favourites. Um, people don't want it. Well, that's utter nonsense. Um, and, you know, I'm sick of hearing that. Um, it's your fault. <laughs> it's the message that you're giving the person. If somebody's telling you that they don't want a supply of naloxone, then that's up to you to change their mind. Um, so if somebody's saying to, you, um, saying to the person, so do you want that naloxone training? Well, no, because quite frankly, that sounds crap. Um, so it's about the way you sell it. Um, if you make it sound as important as it actually is and you're enthusiastic about it and you make that person feel like you really want them to give, give, want to give them a supply, then nobody will refuse a supply from you. Um, and it goes back to that whole thing about this punitive practice and, you know, sometimes people in services not wanting to accept a supply from someone for fear of admitting that they're continuing to put themselves at risk. Um, so all that kind of practice needs to change. So my answer to that is change your message. Um, the last one that I chose, because there was hundreds, I'd have been here all day, um, this whole thing about well, naloxone encourages drug use. So if we're supplying uh, somebody with naloxone, that's making it acceptable that we um, are going to encourage them to take uh, heroin. Well, we don't know of anybody who spends often all day sourcing maybe their money and getting their heroin just to think to themselves, right, well, I've got my naloxone available, so I'll be able to reverse the effects of this drug I've spent all day trying to get. Um, it would also be quite a miraculous occurrence if someone was able to administer naloxone to themselves when they were unconscious. Um, so you'd have to be pretty trusting of the people round about you to actually administer naloxone should you overdose. Um, but that's absolute nonsense again, so no evidence for that. Um, so my answer to the whole of that is uh, stop all these nonsense excuses and just get on and do it. <coughs> okay, so um, what's next then? Um, Jason, my colleague's here, um, he's working on the Naloxone Peer Education Initiative. Um, this is a fantastic new strand to the national programme, so involving people with a history of drug use or who are currently using, um, to get them more involved um, in actually delivering the training to their peers to massively increase the reach of the programme. I've not got time to go into a huge amount of detail about it, but please catch up with myself or Jason if you're interested in hearing more about that. But those guys have been doing some fantastic work linking in with community addiction teams, linking in with pharmacists um, and dispelling a huge amount of myths in their communities about how to deal with an overdose but also about naloxone itself. Um, 
GP engagement, um, well that's going to be another um, part of the, the work plan for the year. Now that we have the new licensed product, GPs are now in a position where they can write a prescription for naloxone. In some areas across Scotland, about 3,000 people are seeing their GP and not the statutory services like uh, community addiction teams. Um, so there's a big area there to still be covered. Um, so that's going to be another piece of work. Although engaging GPs is going to be quite a challenge as well. We did a needs assessment report on engaging GPs and a huge amount of stigma came out in that report as well for, for actually seeing drug users in the first place, never mind being involved in the, in the Naloxone programme. So all that's going to be addressed as well. So, so darling. Um, Supporting the delivery in prisons, um, trying to get the prisons to replicate a lot of the brief intervention work that's happening in the community. One minute, right, okay, go on. Uh, <laughs> here's me saying I was anxious. Um, supporting the delivery in prisons, um, they really need a push, trying to replicate a lot of the brief intervention work that's happening with uh, naloxone in the communities into the prisons, also delivering the peer education plan in the prisons as well, and we um, trained our first group of prisoners, which was fantastic, and they're doing a great job. Um, local training leads in health board areas and then further engagement with the police. The police work is going to be a, a big part of work as well. I've not got time to talk too much about that. Um, so this is, a, a, I suppose, when I, when I see all this stuff about what's happening across the world when it looks, when it really frustrates me, you know, this is, um, let's stop all this kind of pondering about should we, shouldn't we? Um, will we, will we not? Uh, yeah, you should. Um, there's absolutely no reason not to. Uh, we know naloxone works. It's been around since 1919. Um, it's not something new. It's just that it needs to be in the hands of the people who actually need it. So thank you very much.